great pleasure to come here at the right time. It's a very beautiful time. And it's my first trip to Korea. So, but uh, I would like to thank San Yun for inviting me to come here. So, uh, okay, so uh, today I'm going to talk about circular current of graphs. Uh, uh, I suppose uh, the audience, not all of them from, uh, from graph theory background, right? So I start from the very basic things. And graph theory, maybe the most famous result in graph theory is the four color theorem. Many people there from outside of graph theory, even from outside of mathematics, they know four color theorem. Right? And uh, uh, so when, when I was doing PhD degree in uh, Canada, I went to see a doctor. The doctor asked me, so what are you doing in, in the university? I said, I'm studying mathematics. Then he started talking to me about four color theorem. <laughs> I was wondering how he knew about the four color theorem. He told me that he has a friend and his friend was a tailor in England. And his friend has been working on four color theorem all, the, all his lifetime. <laughs> It's a tailor, it's not a mathematician, okay? <laughs> okay, so what is a graph coloring? So suppose we're given a graph. A graph consists of vertices and edges, right? And uh, you're given a, a number, an integer, and what you, for example, take k equals three, what you want to do, the k coloring is to color the vertices, color each of the vertices with one of the k integers, that's called the colors, so that adjacent vertices, this sign means that this vertex and this vertex are adjacent, it means there's an H between them. If there's an H, so this, this is a vertex, this is a vertex, and this is an H between these two vertices. If two vertices are adjacent, that means they're connected by an H, then they should get different colors. They should get different colors. And this is called, this. for example, this is the three coloring of this graph. Okay. The colors came from these three integers, and the adjacent values get different colors. And the chromatic number of a graph is the minimum number of colors needed to color the graph. Okay. And for example, in this graph, we just seen that three colors I can color it. If you want to use two colors, then that's not enough. Suppose I want to use two colors. You only have zero and a one. So if I color this, this vertex by color one, zero, this cannot be colored by zero. It has to be colored by color one. And this one cannot be colored by one because it's adjacent to vertex color one. It has to be zero. And this has to be one. Now you have no color for this vertex anymore. So this is not three color. It's not two colorable but it's three colorable. We just seen it, so therefore the chromatic number is, is three. Okay, this, what is the four color theorem? The four color theorem, I guess many people know it, even if you're not in graph theory. If in the graph language, that says that if your graph can be drawn on the piece of paper, on the plane, so that no edge crossing each other, if you can draw the graph in such a way then the chromatic number is at most four. You can color it by four colors. That's four color theorem. It's the most famous theorem in graph theory and one of the most famous theorem in, in mathematics. It's also a very difficult theorem. Okay, so this is the definition of K coloring of a graph. Okay? What I'm going to talk about today is circular coloring of a graph. So I'm going to change its definition modify this definition a little bit. So what, is, what are the modification? So first uh, I, I replace this requirement fx different from fy by this, by this inequality. This is the same because all the colors came from this set. If they are different, the difference is at least one. And their difference is at, of course, at most k minus one. So this is the same as saying they are different. Okay? So I replace it by this condition. That's the same as the original definition. It's a different expression. 
Then I'm going to change this integer. Instead of integer, I allow this k to be a real number. Okay. Now, instead of uh, uh, k coloring, now I have a circular k coloring. Instead of using these integer as colors, I'm going to use all the real numbers from this interval as colors. Okay. Now, I do not change anything else. That is called the circular k coloring of the graph. Okay. It's called the circular k coloring of the graph. And for example, this is uh, originally we have a three coloring of this graph. Now I have a 2.5 coloring of this graph. Okay, it's a circular 2.5 coloring. So you can check if you look at any age, any age, the difference, the colors that come from 0 and 2.5. Okay, and you look at any age, the difference is at least 1 and at most 1.5. That's 2.5 minus 1. So that's a 2.5 coloring. Okay. And uh, uh, so usually, so now this k, this k is not an integer anymore, it's a real number. So usually we use uh, k to represent the integers, so I re we replace this k by another notice sign, another letter, so it's r. This is called an, a circular r coloring, okay, circular r coloring. Okay, so the circular chromatic number of a graph, then that's the minimum r, or the infimum, because now it's not integer, your definition may be better use infimum. Infimum of those R, that G has a circular R coloring. Okay. And this can be replaced by minimum, but this you need a proof. You need to proof that this infimum is attained, so it can be replaced by minimum. Now, if you have a K coloring, original K coloring, then of course it's already a circular K coloring, right? The definition says it's now. This means that the circular chromatic number is at most as big as the chromatic number. On the other hand, if you have a circular R coloring, you take the floor of each color. So this is this is the color you assign to the vertex, and this is not integer. It's any real number. You take the floor, it became an integer. So if you take this any circular R coloring f. You take the floor of the color, you get an integer coloring. Now this integer coloring is indeed a coloring because different vertices, the color difference is at least one in F. Therefore, the taken floor, they cannot be the same. Right? The difference is still at least one. So therefore, it's indeed a proper coloring. And how many colors you used? You used this many colors. You used this many colors. You used zero, one, up to R floor, and therefore it is R ceiling, that many colors. And this shows, for example, this is a 2.5 coloring. I take the floor, I get this coloring. Okay. So therefore, it's, um, uh, you get a three coloring, and the way, what we get is that uh, the chromatic number is less or equal to the ceiling of the circular chromatic number. And because we have this condition, we have we know that it's, it's, uh, it's the circular chromatic number is less or equal to the chromatic number. Therefore, this chromatic number is equal to the ceiling. So this is the basic relation. The circular chromatic number is always between the chromatic number and the chromatic number minus one. It's strictly bigger than the chromatic number minus one. So the chromatic number measures the certain certain feature of the graph, right? It measures the graph, how, how, how big is your chromatic number. It's always an integer. It's always integer. It's, we can think of chi g measures the, measures the, um, uh, the chromatic number of a graph, but it's only in integers. But if you look at the circular chromatic number, it is a finer measure. You, you have the circular chromatic could be any things between two integers. It's a, it's a better measure. So you have more. Uh, it's a finer scale to measure this, the, the graph. Right? So, uh, I, so the, the circular chromatic number of graph is a refinement of the chromatic number. 
Another way to say it is the chromatic number is approximation of the circular chromatic number. And in this sense, I, we say the circular chromatic number is the real chromatic number. The original chromatic number is just uh, approximation. I would like to compare this with when people ask, uh, how old are you? You always tell them an integer, right? <laughs> but that's not your real age. Okay? So, say, how old are you? You should, uh, if you are very precise, you say, maybe. <laughs> that you don't say it. You either take, actually different cultures take different things. In Chinese culture, we take the ceiling. I don't know what is Korean do. In the, in the Western culture, they take the floor, right? <laughs> but anyway, it's, a, it's approximation. What you tell them is approximation. And then say, okay, what's your chromatic number? <laughs> the chromatic number is 2.5, not 3. 3 is approximation. So why is called circular? Why is the, 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 the number is called circular? Okay, so all numbers, the colors, so original coloring, the colors are from uh, integers. Now the coloring are from this, this interval, from zero to R. All, this real, all the real numbers in this interval are colors. Suppose we identify this zero and, one, zero and R into a single point, we get a circle. Identify this zero and R. Okay, you take any two points in this, in this, on this circle. The distance between these two points is just uh, uh, the minimum of these two, the minimum of the length of this arc and this arc, right? That's the distance of these two points on this circle. And uh, so what is a circular arc coloring? A circular arc coloring is color the vertices with points from this circle so that if two vertices are adjacent, then their colors has distance at least one. That is circular uh, coloring. Okay. And uh, 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 graph coloring is very hot topic in graph theory. Uh, one thing is that you have many challenging problems, like four color theorem. Okay. And the other thing is that it's very uh, useful. It has application in many different places. So graph coloring is actually a distribution of resources. You have many resources and you want to give to uh, some there's consumers of these sources, right? And the graph represents some conflicts between consumers and uh, you want to distribute these resources so that the constraints are satisfied. Uh, I will show you uh, one example later. So this is a graph current, it's a resource distribution problem. And uh, circular current is a distribution of resource of periodic nature. I give you examples. But. So this is the uh, uh, map of downtown Bielefeld in Germany. I stayed there for two years, almost two years. And this is the five streets meeting in a downtown area. And uh, 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 in Germany, the traffic laws are strictly uh, uh, followed, right? It's, uh, when, when there's a red night, uh, for the pa pedestrians, the pedestrians will wait there, even there's no car, <laughs> okay, so. Okay, so there are many traffic flows. So this is the traffic flow, and this is another traffic flow. These two traffic flows, they conflict each other. That means you cannot have cars moving at the same time, right, if you don't want an, to have an accident. Okay? And these two traffic flows, they are consistent. They, they do not conflict to each other. They can, they can move at the same time. So I have many, I have many traffic flows. These are all the traffic flows. And they build a graph so that uh, if, uh, uh, if, if these two traffic flows conflict, conflict with each other, then I put an edge between them. And I get a graph. Right? What I want to do, so I want to, diff, I want to build a traffic, the traffic control site there, red, green lights for the traffic flows. I need to assign, I need to assign to each traffic flow a period of green lights. Green light, right? And this, in the complete traffic period, each traffic flow get one chance of moving. Okay? Each traffic get one chance. 
Suppose each traffic light's length is unit length. Then what I'm to do, what I'm, what I need to do is uh, this is uh, a complete traffic period is represented by a cycle. Okay. What I want to do is to assign to each traffic flow a, a, a interval of this cycle. That is the green light phase of that traffic flow. So if two traffic flows conflict with each other, then these two intervals should not intersect each other. Okay, that's the, now, if we look at the, for each, for each traffic flow, I look at the starting point, starting point of the green face, that is a point of this circle. So what I'm trying to do is that adjacent points, they, they are starting for adjacent traffic flows, their starting point is a distance uh, of distance at least one, right? And our goal is to minimize the total length of the complete traffic period. That is exactly calculating the circular Mach number of the graph. Okay? So if you're taking integer coloring, that is approximation. That's, that maybe, uh, maybe use more time. Okay? You may use, say for example, for the five cycle, you, may, you use three units of time to complete the traffic flow. But you use the circular coloring only 2.5 units of time is enough. So that's an uh, improvement. Okay? So that, that's what I mean, that circular chromatic number, circular kind of graph is a refined, it's, it's a model for resource distribution problem of periodic nature. Okay? This is because this is true because the traffic flow this is periodic, right? The, the flight, the traffic line is periodic. So this parameter was introduced by Vince in 1988. He called the star chromatic number, star chromatic number for graph. And later we, uh, we changed it to circular chromatic number. So now I think uh, roughly calculation shows that there may be more than 250 papers published. And uh, in 2003, uh, these two, three authors made uh, uh, wrote in their papers is the theory of circular cardinal graphs has become an important branch of chromatic graph theory with many exciting results and new techniques. This is more true today because that statement was made in uh, 2003. Okay, so mm, okay, so that's a clock there, okay. Okay, so what I want to show today is that uh, uh, why why this is uh, uh, many people studying this, studying this concept, and uh, what is interesting about it? Okay, I want to I want to make it more interesting. If if, uh, if after talk some people get interested, that will be very good. I'll be <laughs> very happy. Okay, so as I mentioned, that the circular economy is a good model for periodic scheduling problems. And that's uh, like traffic night problem. And uh, another, per another feature is that the circular chromatic number, it's, it's a refinement of the chromatic number. Therefore, it reveals more information about the structure of the graph. It contains more information about the structure. And the third thing is that the most important thing, part is that it stimulates challenging problems, leads to better understanding of the chromatic graph theory. I would, I would, for each of them, I'll give you some examples. And this, I will just briefly mention it, that uh, uh, where I mentioned this traffic flow problem, that's too easy, not many people using uh, graph theory to, to solve this problem. But there are many other periodic scheduling problems in computer science. And actually, in, uh, in 1986, the reciprocal of this parameter was introduced by uh, computer scientists. And they are starting uh, scheduling problems. And they somehow, somehow they came up with a parameter which turned out to be the reciprocal of this parameter. So we didn't know about it. This computer scientist didn't know about graph theory, what the graph theory people are doing. And the graph theory people didn't know what the, the computer scientists are doing. But then later we'll find out actually they are working on the same thing. They don't know each other. So it is indeed useful in, in practical problems. And uh, uh, 
Uh, next thing is I want to say that this parameter contains more information. And for example, if you take the other cycles, intuitively it's, uh, it's quite interesting. If you take other cycles, and the other cycles, it's chromatic number three, but uh, as, uh, other cycle is almost too colorable, right? It's if it, especially when the cycle is very long, it, it just one color, you just need to break it in one place, you can two color it. So it's almost too colorable. And this is shown in the circular chromatic number. Circular chromatic number is two plus one over k. Okay? So when k is large, the C2k is almost too colorable. This, this information is contained in the circular Mark number. And there are um, problems like this. Uh, of course, this result is easy, and there are also difficult problems of this, uh, uh, in this direction. Uh, many years ago, I, rose, I asked one question, which was only solved recently by these four authors, and which says that uh, uh, if the graph has a uh, fixed tree width, if the tree width is fixed, if the art, if the art goes, it does not, if, so this means that if a graph has a small tree width and it does not contain small art cycles, okay, if a small tree width and does not contain small art cycles, then the circular chromatic number is also close to two. It's almost too curable. Uh, uh, so, I didn't plan to, <laughs> to do, <laughs> okay, I didn't plan to uh, define tree width here. I want, just want to show this, uh, uh, some, some flavor of this result because um, uh, intuitively tree width means that uh, uh, you can break this, the, tree, the, the graph is not too complicated. It's, uh, it's like, like a tree things, but the, the tree is, um, uh, uh, the graph is not, um, you can cut it into pieces by taking small cuts. Uh, you can cut into small pieces, each cut is small, in that sense. The, this, this small is the tree width, how, how big is the cut to, to break it into small pieces. It's intuitively, but definition I will, I will pass it. Is the tree width necessary on the theorem? Yeah, yeah, the tree width is necessary because uh, uh, you can have, you can have large, you can have a graph of large girth and large circular chromatic number. Yeah. Yeah. The tree width is necessary and large art girth is necessary. Okay, uh, so it, intuitively, uh, there are many things that are intuitively true that is shown up in the circular column, circular chromatic number. This, for example, this, this theorem says that um, if, you, if your graph is cr critical and chromatic, what does that mean? That means you need n colors. You need n colors to color it, but if you remove any vertex, it's n minus one colorable. So it re requires n colors, but n color, the nth color is barely needed. Okay. It's needed only for one vertex. In, if your graph is this kind of graph, then intuitively it's almost n minus one colorable. Okay. And this theorem says that this is true. If the girth is large, of course, you need to put the large girth here. If the girth is large, it's enchromatic, then it's, it's, it's almost a minus one color. Of course, this epsilon here depends on the girth. Epsilon depends on the girth. Okay. The girth is larger, the epsilon is smaller. On the other hand, if the graph is uniquely enchromatic, uniquely enchromatic, that means you can color it by n colors, but there's only one way to color it. So there's no room to move anything. Right? In this case, the circular chromatic number is also n. So this information is shown up in here. So if the circular chromatic number is, is n, somehow it means that you really need n colors in some sense. Right? Okay, so the most important part I think is 
This concept stimulates challenging problems, leads to better understanding of the chromatic graph theory. Okay, this, is the most, this is why many people started. One, one good thing about this is that uh, uh, it's related to a uh, well-studied parameter. Whatever questions you studied for chromatic number, you can ask for the circular chromatic number. Whatever results you have for chromatic number, you can try to prove it for circular chromatic number. So there are many uh, classical results concerning chromatic numbers that are generalized, that can be generalized to circular chromatic number. And these generalizations, most of the generalizations are quite non-trivial. Okay? Quite non-trivial. It needs finer tools and it leads, it will Get, you will get to better understanding of the old problem, of the old results, by proving the stronger results. Okay. So I will show you some examples of classical results uh, generalized to circular chromatic numbers. Okay. One classical result is uh, Paul Eldish's theorem. So why, so why a graph needs many colors to be colored, to color it? Okay. What is the reason? For a graph to need many colors. One obvious reason, one trivial reason, is that if the graph has a large clique, that means if your graph has, say for example, if the graph has 100 vertices, that any two of them are connected by an edge. That's a clique of size 100. Then of course you need at least 100 colors to color it, right? Because each of these 100 vertices need a different color. But Paul Eldridge results shows that this is, the chromatic number is really a global thing, it's not a local thing. This is not the only reason. Okay? The, this theorem says that you can have, for any, any integer n, you can have a graph which has girth, at least g, and the chromatic number n. What is the girth? The girth is, the, is the, the length of the shortest cycle. So the girth is greater or equal to g, and that means the graph has no cycle of length smaller than g. Okay. So locally, if you look at the graph locally, you look at one vertex, you look at those vertices which have distance, g minus, distance, say, half g to these vertices. You look at the, this graph, this subgraph induced by the neighborhood, this kind of neighborhood of this vertex, what is it? What is it? It is a tree. It is, there's no cycle in it. So a tree is too colorable. Right? It's too colorable thing. So locally, it's easy to two color it, but globally, you need many, many colors. So this, this theorem says this. So this is a very classical result, and this is the first result that uh, uh, this is the result that initiated the study of probability argument, the probability method in graph theory, which is now a very powerful tool, in, uh, in not, in, not only in graph theory, in combinatorics and in many other areas. And uh, we can uh, generalize this to circular chromatic number. So for any, for any girth, for any, uh, for any girth and for any rational number, which is greater than 2, greater or equal to 2, you can find a graph whose circular chromatic number is exactly R, and the guess is big. Okay. And this needs to, uh, uh, then we found to generalize this result to, okay, so I would say the, the proof of this one is, is, not, uh, uh, is not difficult. It's about the same, we use probability argument, it's about the same idea. And uh, uh, then we generalize to, so needs to, to generalize about the graph homomorphisms. And uh, 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 graph homomorphism is, uh, is uh, generalization of graph coloring. Okay? And I'll, I will pass it. I just mentioned that we can, uh, that, that it leads to uh, other ways of looking at the older results and leads to other generalizations by looking at this concept. Right? Okay, another, 
another results, classical results, which is uh, uh, about the chromatic number of Knaser graph. The Knaser graph is, is the following graph. The vertex set of this graph are all K subsets of this N set. Okay? And two vertices, that's two vertices, that's two K subsets. Okay? Each vertex is a K subset. Two vertices are adjacent if they are disjoint. Okay? For example, so this is K, this is the Peterson graph. The Peterson graph is K G52. What, what does that mean? Each vertex is a two element set of the five set. So this vertex is one, two. This is two element set. Okay, this is one and a two. It's two element set. And this is three, four. And each element, each vertex is a two element set. There are ten two element set of this five set. And you check each edge, just connect two vertices that repre that's represented by two disjoint subsets to disjoint two sets. Okay. Now, this is a, a fam this Knesset graph. The Peterson graph, of course, is a very famous graph in graph theory. And the Knesset graph, in general, is a, is a very uh, uh, well-known graph class in graph theory. So, what? So if, what? Uh, uh, the complement, you take the complement. So, x intersection y is non-empty, uh -huh. then we say equivalent to the complement. What kind of graph is Well, that's, that's the complement of this graph. It's the complement of the kinesis graph. Uh, uh, that's also an interesting class, but we, because it's, it's a complement of this class, so we can ask many problems of that graph. And instead of asking questions in that graph, we, we can change that, gra that problem into this, gra this class of graph. For example, yeah. Yeah, for example, if you ask, okay, what are the clique number of that graph? That's the same thing as uh, what are the independent set of this graph. So because this graph is, this class is more famous, we use this name instead of the other name. Uh, this is an interesting class, anyway. There, there are more general, general, generalizations of this class of graphs also. It's, you, can, you can say the intersection is small or intersection, how, much, how big is the intersection. There are many different ways of, of generalize this class of graphs. Okay, there's an easy n minus 2k plus 2 current of this graph. Okay? This current is, uh, uh, is each color set, this is how, how to color this with n minus 2k plus 2 coloring of this graph. I think if you give it as a, an exercise to, to, uh, to students, say you find n minus 2k plus 2 coloring of this graph, I think most of the students will find it. It's, it's, it's not difficult to, to call it. And, but th this shows that chromatic number is at most n minus 2k plus 2. Right? But the conjecture remained open for a long time. The conjecture says this is the best you can do. Right? You cannot call it by n minus 2k plus 1 color. And this is Knesset conjecture. It was conjectured in 1955. And it was proved by Novash. And this proof is very famous because he used algebraic topology in the proof. And that is the first paper to use algebraic topology in the study of, of, of graph coloring problems. And now it's, it became a very powerful tool. And there are many uh, results using this topological method. So it's, it's become a method it became a method. So that's, this is the origin of the method. Okay. And uh, 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 we, know the, we know the circular chromatic number is less or equal to the chromatic number. And uh, it could be the same. There's a was conjectured in 1997 that uh, the circular chromatic number is also 
n minus 2k plus 2. You cannot do better. You cannot even color this graph by n minus 2k plus 1.99. Okay. So you must need, you need n minus 2k plus 2. This was conjecture in 1997. And this was solved this year by um, uh, a professor in Taiwan. That's uh, actually when, uh, when he was... Uh, uh, professor, we, we, we were in the same city before, and he came to my lecture. I talked about this, uh, talked about this problem, and he started working on it. He started working on it for many years, and eventually he solved it last year, and it's published this year. And this proof uh, use topological method again. It's, it, it has to refine the tools. It has to, to understand the current better than the original proof. Okay? What he proved is very interesting. What he proved is very strong result about coloring. Okay? What he proved is the following. Say, he proved that if you want any n minus, okay, to prove the original Knesset conjecture, what you need to prove, you need to prove that for any n minus 2k plus 2 coloring of the graph, every color is used. Right? Every color is used on some vertex. You cannot say, I do not use this color. If you do not use one color, then you use n minus 2k plus one color. Okay? So that's the, the original result. Original conjecture says, you must use every color. Okay? And what he proved is called alternative Knesset current theorem. What he proved is this. He can prove, so for any, if you color this graph, using n minus 2k plus 2 colors, then he can find two subsets, S and T, each of size k minus 1. And the remaining vertices, they are n minus 2k plus 2 vertices, remaining, remaining numbers, not, not vertices. This is because each vertex is a k element subset, right, of the n set. This is the set. This is, this is a set n minus set of the of the n set of this of this one to 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 n of this set you can find a k minus one subset of uh, of this n set okay Re remember that each vertex of the Knesset graph is a k subset okay what you can do you can find the m minus one subset of the n set another m minus disjoint Another n minus one subset of this n set, and the, they are, the remain all this because it's an n set. The remaining elements they are n minus two k plus two of them. Okay? You can list it like this. This is these are the remaining vertices, Re not vertices, remaining elements of the n set. So that what ha what is true is that if you look at this this s s union this I1, this is a K subset, right? Because this is a K minus one subset, and you add one point inside, this is a K subset. And this is also a K subset. He can show that you can find these two subsets in such a way that these two sets are colored by color one. And these two sets are colored by color two. And these two sets are colored by color and minus two K plus two. So this is very much better understanding of what the current can, 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 can you get. Right? You can have such a structure in this current. Of course, every color has to be used. Not only every color has to be used, it has to be used in this way. Okay? So this is very much better understanding of the original current. Okay, so another, another classical result so I'm supposed to finish at uh, five, uh, five. Oh, I have 20 minutes. Okay. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, another result, classical results, is about um, a perfect graph. A perfect graph is, is a graph that every subgraph, every induced subgraph has its chromatic number equals clique number. Okay, the, as I mentioned before, the clique number is always a lower bound for the chromatic number. Now, if you have a clique of size k, then of course you need k colors. And if you, k colors is, is enough, then that's chromatic number equals clique number. 
If the Cromach number equals click number for every induced subgraph, then such a graph is called perfect. For a perfect graph, uh, Okay, there, there are many results. One, this is the most famous one is about the strong perfect graph conjecture. I, I don't know if this, uh, Marianne talked about this, or they, they are the authors to prove that. And one of the uh, uh, famous results is another one is about the complexity of uh, calculus. This is the clique number. Okay, I just mentioned it. And the color graph is circular perfect if the circular Cromach number equals the circular click number. This is the circular click number. Okay, so uh, again, uh, uh, I'm not going to define a circular click number, <laughs> just uh, to say there is a corresponding part. And one of the f famous results about the perfect graph is that, is that uh, for perfect graphs, the chromatic number is computable in polynomial time. Okay. And uh, um, uh, for this proof, uh, they use this elliptic method to, to do this calculation, to calculate this uh, uh, theta number of graphs, and then uh, to... Uh, so it, it's, it's, it's a very... Uh, it's a difficult result, and it's a famous result in about perfect graphs, about the, in chromatic graph theory. And then, uh, many years ago, I asked if this, if this is true, if, the, if for circular perfect graphs, the circular chromatic number can be computed in polynomial time. I wonder if this is true. And recently, this is proof. This is theorem by this... Uh, um, Three or this is these are three authors, three authors from um, Bordeaux, France, and they proved that this is true. And for this proof, they really have to um, uh, to have a better understanding of the original uh, results and to to modify the tools. And it's um, it's a quite uh, uh, difficult proof. It used many uh, tools from number theory, from analysis, and uh, the key, one of the key steps is to calculate the NOVA theta number of circular cliques and their complements. And the formula is, uh, is something like this. The theta, theta number of these complements of the circular cliques is equal to this number. And for, to prove this, they really use very sophisticated tools from different fields of mathematics. And say so this is what I mean by uh, this, this concept, stimulate research in this direction. I have to mention that there are very few family of graphs whose theta number is, the, for which the theta number is not. It's very difficult to calculate the theta numbers. And the, the calculation of the theta number of this family of graph is only one step in the proof. They have many other nice ideas. Okay. okay. Another, another um, uh, thing about uh, classical results about uh, chromatic number, chromatic graph theory is the... So, I, I mentioned these results. Each of these results is actually not an isolated result. It's a start point of some, um, some theory is a start point of some general method which is going to be used later, like the algebraic, like the uh, topological method, like this uh, um, uh, elliptic method, like this um, uh, probabilistic method. And another method, very powerful too in, uh, in graph theory, is, uh, in gra especially in chromatic graph theory, is combinatorial and Stanislas. Okay, so what is, what is, what is the uh, result? Uh, suppose I have a graph, the vertices are V1, V2, Vn. And I write up, uh, I give an arbitrary orientation. So for each edge, I orient from one vertex to another vertex, and I write a polynomial okay, for this graph. The polynomial is like this. For each edge, Vi, Vj, if there is an edge from Vi to Vj, I take the difference of Xi and Xj. 
and the take product of all these edges in this oriented graph. This is a polynomial associated with this graph. Okay? Now, you take a graph coloring, you color the graph with integers, like you, you, each, in, each vertex is assigned an integer as the color. The color is proper, is a good coloring, that means adjacent vertices are assigned to distinct colors. So that means you take the difference, it's not going to be zero. Right? And therefore the product is non-zero. So if, if you find such assignment, then that is a good coloring. Okay? So to find a good coloring is the same thing as to find a assignment of values to these variables so that the polynomial is non-zero. And then you use, so what is non combinatorial non standard says? Use the tools to, uh, to find the conditions for a polynomial to have a non zero assignment. Then you get, you, in that way, you get a good coloring of the graph. So that is the, that is the idea of combinatorial non standard says. Okay, so. Uh, so this is this is uh, one of the this is the uh, theorems that we used to find uh, good currents. There's there's a theorem which tells you when there's a sufficient condition for the polynomial to have a non-zero assignment. Okay. We use this one. So this is called non combinatorial non standard size. Okay. So now uh, questions is what is the polynomial? So we we modify this. Uh, definition of current to circular current. What is the polynomial for the circular Cromach number? Okay. So that you can you can say the same thing. You can use the same tools. Okay. Well, it is not so trivial now because you say the the colors are from these these real numbers, and what. The good coloring is the color have a certain distance. It's a certain distance. It's not different. Okay. So this this kind of polynomial seems does not work anymore. Well, it does not work because you haven't got the right idea. Right? It works if you have the right idea, and um, uh, 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 Nor Noring. Ignoring, he was here uh, some time ago. He came up with the idea with uh, uh, changing this get the right polynomial, and that turns out to be useful also. Okay, suppose p and q are positive integers, and we take this zp as this uh, p integers, and we say a pq current of the graph is current with these integers colors, so that adjacent vertices is the color differs by at least q and at the most p minus q. That's called the pq coloring. And for example, this is a 5-2 coloring of this pentagon. Okay? So you, all the colors from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and if you look at an edge, the color difference is at least 2 and at most 3. The, a p1 coloring is just original p coloring, right? It is color different. That means the color has to be different. And uh, what is the relation between such a current and a circular current? Well, you can put this, put this p colors on a circle in this way. Okay? And uh, so a, a, a current assigns colors to these vertices so that you look at the circular distance. Okay, sorry. You look at the circular distance is at least q. That means if you so original this this condition this condition is that means you look at the circle the difference that means the distance is at least q between these two colors assigned to these vertices. Well, this is by viewing the the distance between these two integers is one. If I say the distance between these two integers is one over q, then this just means the distance is one. And the circle has length p over q. And this is a kind of approximation of the original. Originally, I used every real number as colors. Now I use this uh, only finite number of colors from the, from the unit, from the circle. But 
you can make the color denser and denser by picking bigger and bigger P. Right? So that is, that it does not, so eventually it's the same as the circular current of the graph. Okay? And therefore the circular Kumark number is actually the minimum of this P over Q, the G has a PQ current. Okay, now what is the polynomial for circular current? If I write in this way, what is this, what is the polynomial for circular current? Okay, so this, this is actually, this is the right polynomial. This polynomial now not, is not in the field of real numbers, it goes to the field in complex numbers. Okay? So you, for any age, for any age, what you do, you take this product, xj minus xj prime, but not just minus xj prime, you minus xj prime multiplied by this number. This i is the complex, this is the square root of minus one, this is complex number. So what is the idea behind it? The idea behind it is that I, I take this, these are the colors, I make the uh, correspondence between these colors, j, and this complex number. This is the, the, the roots of one in the in the complex plane. And then you multiply it by this, you just shift it, right? You multiply this, shift one step and shift, and this means you shift from the, to the left and shift to the right by at most Q minus one steps. It, it will not coincide. So that's the same thing as that it will not, uh, the distance is at least one. And therefore, and therefore you can have a, you can, this is a, so I, 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 I associate each, each numbers in this set, this is, this is the set of 0, 1 to, to p minus 1, I associate each integer here with this point on this unit circle of this complex plane. And then this is a, this is a good current, this is a good current if and only if I put these numbers into the, sorry, I put these numbers into this um, polynomial, it's non-zero. So therefore, I can use this combinatorial Einstein as us again. Okay. Of course, to use this combinatorial Einstein as us, you, what you need to do is you need to prove that certain coefficient is non-zero. Coefficient is non-zero. Uh, the degree is easy to calculate, and the, this part is difficult. And uh, for for the complex numbers, it's it it seems to be more difficult. But at least you you have the way to do it. You you, you can try it, and we succeeded to generalize some results into this um, into this uh, um, circular Kramark number. This is about bipartite graphs and. Uh, this is the generalization of this, uh, uh, of this Q, when Q equals one, that's the, that's the ordinary current, right? That's the ordinary current. The ordinary current is a result proved by Alan and Tassi, which is a very powerful result. For example, the, the result shows that planar, bipartite planar graphs are three truthful. You can, if each of it is given three permissible color, then you can color that result I, up today, I know only that proof, use this combinatorial Einstein as I don't know any other proof. Maybe, I don't know, maybe, I think there's no other proof. So we generalize these results to circular kind. Of course, this involves uh, to calculate certain coefficient is non-zero. Then the calculation involves, uh, involves uh, complex numbers. It, it's indeed much more complicated than the original. Uh, so, uh, so this, to calculate the coefficient, I'm not going to go through this uh, calculations. It's just uh, 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 involves some, some um, uh, properties of the complex numbers. I have to, uh, I have to say that we, we haven't used any uh, sophisticated tools from the complex analysis. Complex analysis is a very beautiful branch of mathematics and I think 
uh, there is basically um, no application of complex analysis to graph coloring yet. And uh, we, we, this is, uh, we, we use this polynomial from complex using complex variables, but uh, we haven't used uh, uh, those nice tools there. I hope that, that some of those tools can be used here, but we haven't, but we succeeded to prove something okay, by using this. I'm not going to go through it. So this is, um, this is the result of proof. And uh, I shouldn't say thank you. For your attention. All right, thank you very much.